Hello, I'm Alex Walski, and I will be presenting the chain replication paper. So, what is chain replication? Broadly speaking, it is a replication strategy where servers are organized into a chain. This strategy supports large-scale storage services, has strong consistency guarantees, high throughput, and high availability. The paper defines a storage service as a compromise but between a file system and a database. File systems are unstructured, so they are slow to query, but they use idempotent operations, meaning that the result of uh, the operation is the same no matter how many times it is executed. Additionally, file systems are cheap. On the other hand, databases are structured, so they are fast to query. Databases aren't idempotent, but they are serializable, which means that the database will remain consistent even when many idempotent operations are ex executing concurrently. The downside to databases is their price. Storage services are a happy middle ground. They have a high capacity at a lower cost and can support relatively complex query operations. This paper will focus on chain replication as it applies to storage services. A storage service supports two operations. The first is a query operation, which returns a value derived from a single object, and a programmable update operation that automatically changes, or that atomically changes an object. Unlike most other solutions with high availability and throughput, chain replication offers strong consistency guarantees. These are, one, operations that query or update are executed in sequential order, and two, the effects of an update operation are reflected on every subsequent query operation. These guarantees are mandatory for some applications, but when they're not, they still significantly simplify the implementation. Now, let's look at the chain how the chain replication system works, starting off with the client interface. When the client wants to read or write to an object, it will send a request to the distributed system. To notify the client that the operation executed successfully, the distributed system will send a reply back. If the client doesn't receive a reply for a certain duration, it will assume that the request was either lost or ignored and resend the operation. This can be an issue if the operation isn't idempotent. In this case, the client can first query the target data to check if the operation was executed before resending the operation. Here are more detailed explanations on the query and update operations. Query takes an object ID to specify the object being read from and op an options variable to specify which attributes of the object are being read. The server will generate a return value based on the object ID and return it in the reply to the client. The update operation is similar, but contains an additional new value parameter to update the object with, and the reply value is used as a new object ID. In both cases, the reply value will depend on the options passed to the request, or in the request. Next, we'll look at how the servers are organized in a chain replication system. For a chain replication system to work, all the servers need to be fail stop. This means that when the server fails, it halts operation instead of continuing and making erroneous changes. Fail stopped servers must also be detectable by the rest of the network for recovery to begin. And lastly, servers must execute operations serially. This guarantees that the database will remain consistent even when non idempotent operations are executed concurrently. As I said earlier, the servers are connected uh, to form a chain. The first server is called the head and the last is the tail. This is analogous to a bidirectional linked list. Each server contains a replica of the data stored in the tail, and they communicate in a first in first out fashion. The server uh, before another or toward the head is called that server's predecessor, and the server after or toward the tail is the successor. When the client wants to query a value, it sends the operation request to the tail server. The tail server then simply returns the copy of the data it has stored locally, because the um, primary replica is stored on the tail server. 
This makes uh, for very quick queries and high throughput when reading. Conversely, when the client wants to update a value, it sends the request to the head server. The head server computes the new value of the variable and forwards the request down the chain until it reaches the tail. Along the way, each server will apply the update to its local replica. Once the update request reaches the end, the tail will generate the reply and send it to the client. Because an update request has to pass through each server in the chain, they can involve, involve a lot of latency and take a while. But the benefit is that all of the requests, queries, and updates are ultimately handled by one server, the tail server. Combined with serial execution, this guarantees that a query will return the most updated version of the data. And this is why the chain replication system is so consistent. The chain replication protocol details how the servers coordinate to achieve the behavior that we just discussed. Each server contains three variables to coordinate with the network and prevent inconsistencies. The first is an update history for each object stored on the server. The history starts at the beginning of time, and any new updates are appended to the list. Secondly, the sent variable records all unprocessed updates forwarded by the server that haven't been processed by the tail server yet. And lastly, the list of pending updates that have not been received but not yet processed by the tail server. The history and sent lists are stored locally on each server, but I don't believe that the pending list is actually stored. It is a variable used for defining the, the protocol. Additionally, all servers are only allowed to perform one of three straight state transitions on the history variable of the tail, which contains the primary replica, and the pending variable. Transition 1. The server receives an update request and adds it to the pending list. Transition 2. A client request is ignored and taken off the pending list. Transition 3. A request is processed by the tail server and taken off of the pending list. If the request was an update, it is added to the object history. The tail server then sends a reply to the client. There is also a message protocol um, acknowledge, like acknowledgement called ACK, which is only used by the servers in the chain and not by the client. When the tail server processes an update request, it sends an acknowledgement message to its predecessor. Whenever a server receives an ACK message, it removes the request R from its sent list and forwards the ACK message toward the head. The protocol define, also defines two invariants, or rules that must be maintained in order to guarantee consistency. The update propagation invariant states that the object history of a server must be a prefix of the object history of the server's predecessor. Prefix meaning it contains a subset, an ordered subset. Since updates are propagated from the head toward the tail, the predecessor should either have the same history or one additional update. And the in, -proce the, and the in process requests invariant states that combining the sent list of a server's predecessor with that server's object history will result in the predecessor's object history. Both of these invar invariants are used to guarantee consistency during a server failure recovery. Thanks to the well-defined protocol, recovering from a server failure isn't too difficult. Server failures and server extensions are managed by a program called the master service. This is a program modeled as a single process that never fails, but that's not practical. In practice, it is implemented across multiple hosts. The roles of the master include detecting server failures, reorganizing the chain to recover from a failure, and notifying clients about changes to the chain. In the event of the head server failing, the master service removes the head and makes the next server the new head. If the head was applying an update and failed before forwarding the update, then removing the head would also effectively remove the update from the pending list. 
which was in the pending list because it hasn't been processed by the tail server yet. Removing the process isn't an issue since the client will notice that it doesn't get a reply and reissue the request. And deleting the update along with the head is equivalent to ignoring the update. So this is consistent with T2, which is ignoring an update. In the event of the tail server failing, uh, the master service removes the tail and makes the previous server the new tail. If the tail's predecessor was applying an update and the tail failed before receiving that update, then both the history of the tail and the pending list would be modified. The history is altered because the predecessor, T-1, becomes the new tail, which was oh, which has applied one more operation than the former tail. So the history would gain an entry. And the pending list is altered because the operation that was applied is now taken off of the pending list. This transaction is equivalent to the a typical um, processing of a request, so it is consistent with T3. In the case of a body server failing, or the case of a body server failing is more complex and relies on the sent list. When a body server fails, the master will connect to or connect its predecessor to its successor. The master does this by sending each of these servers its new predecessor or successor. If the failed server was processing an update and never forwarded it, then the update propagation invariant would be violated. Any successive updates would add on to their, the current updates and there would be an inconsistency. To circumvent this, the sent list of the predecessor is transmitted to the successor. Because the pending list and the history of the tail were not modified in this operation, it is considered a uh, no operation and uh, doesn't need to be consistent with the state transitions. Lastly, we will briefly talk about how to add more servers to the chain. Theoretically, a server can be added to the chain at any point, but the easiest place to add one is at the tail. So that is what we will discuss. To extend the tail, we need to copy the data over from the current tail T to the new server, which we'll call T plus one. During typical operation, the sent list of the tail is empty because it doesn't need to forward any updates down the line. That makes it much easier to copy the sent list because it's just empty. The history list can also be transferred, but it can be very large, so the transfer will take time. During the transfer, the original tail T will continue its normal operation as the tail. And any new updates it gets, it'll start uh, storing in the sent list to be sent to T plus one once it is ready to take over as a new tail. Once the history, the transfer of the history is complete, then the sent list of the tail will be sent to T plus one and the T plus one will be made into the new tail. So let's re um, review some of the things we've learned to answer the study questions. How does the chain replication protocol guarantee strong consistency? All the requests and replies are ultimately handled by one server, the tail server. So any read that a client performs will always get the most current version of that data. Question two, what is the purpose of the service master in the list sent? The master service is needed to coordinate and reorganize the server in the event of a failure. And the sent list is needed in the event that a body server fails. Additionally, the master service will uh, is used for extending the server. What is the update propagation invariant and the in-process requests invariant? The update propagation invariant states that the update history of a server must be a prefix of the update history of its predecessor. The in-process requests invariant states that the update history of a server combined in an XOR operation with the sent list of its predecessor must equate the, to the update history of the predecessor. These invariants are in place to ensure that consistencies, inconsistencies don't arise when a server fails. Question number four, how is the failure of a head, of a head server consistent with T2 and failure of a 
tail consistent with T3. Removing the head may remove an operation from the pending list, which is the equivalent of ignoring that operation, and this is consistent with T2. Removing the tail may remove an operation from the pending list and add that object to the history list of the tail. This is equivalent to a regular processing of an operation and is consistent with T3. Question 5. How can the update propagation variant be invalidated in the case of a failure of other servers, not the head or tail? There can be a case where a server fails because it forwards its update to its successor or before it forwards its update to its successor. In this case, the update will be in the history of the previous servers in the chain and not in the succeeding uh, servers. If a new update were then forwarded, the successor, the successor would no longer be a prefix of the predecessor. Where can we add a new server? A new server can be theoretically added at any point in the chain, but the easiest location is right after the tail. Question 7. What is the value of the list sent for the tail? During nor normal operation, the tail doesn't need to forward updates, so its sent list is empty. But while a server is being added after the tail, uh, the sent list can optionally store new updates. The op other option is to throw away all those updates and have the client resend them all. The last question. How do the servers that make up the links in a chain organize themselves? They are managed by the master service process. Thank you.